In this sixth lesson in our study of the life and the ministry and the theology of Abraham, we're going to be covering quite a bit of ground. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Now these two chapters are a unit. They, they are to be taken together, at least in the big picture. They record a unified complex of events, events that culminate in the, God's judgment on and destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I want in this lesson to simply sketch out in broad strokes some general themes and topics that arise in these two chapters. And there'll be three, three main topics that we'll consider. We're going to see a feast, we're going to see a prayer, and we're going to see a judgment. Or we can maybe expand that just a bit. We're going to look at Abraham's communion with God. Abraham's prayer to God, and then finally, God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. But before we get into these three topics, briefly let me set forth the story. What's going on in these two chapters, the narrative in chapters 18 and 19? Well, in chapter 18, the Lord, along with two angels, appears to Abraham while Abraham is, at, while Abraham is outside his Tent. And just by way of reminder, we've referred to Abraham as a man of tent and altar. And again, we see Abraham next to his tent. Reminded that Abraham is a pilgrim in this world, that Abraham is a pilgrim looking for and longing for a city with foundations, whose builder and maker is God, that Abraham knows that here we have no lasting city. Hebrews 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14. So the Lord with two angels, they appear to Abraham, and then Abraham and Sarah prepare a feast for the Lord. That's the first half of chapter 18. Then as this group of three visitors to Abraham, as they are leaving, the Lord reveals to Abraham what he is about to do, namely that he is about to bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah because of their great sin. And then the second half of chapter 18 records Abraham's prayer and intercession to the Lord, that Abraham will intercede for the righteous, specifically for his nephew Lot and Lot's family. And then finally, chapter 19 records for us the rescue of Lot from Sodom and the actual historical judgment of God on these two wicked cities. So a few comments on each of these three themes. First, we notice a feast. Abraham enjoys communion with the Lord. Well, these three visitors, the Lord and two angels, uh, they come to Abraham and he and Sarah extend hospitality to these three guests. He greets them. He refreshes them. He provides an extravagant meal. In fact, it's a meal fit for a king, we might say. Now, there is much in this scene that there's many details that are not given to us, many details that we might be interested to know, but are simply not given to us. They remain a mystery. But the main theme, the central theme that is brought into view in the first half of chapter 18 is quite clear, and that is the theme of the covenant meal. The theme of the covenant meal. When two parties would enter into a covenant with one another, they would often partake of a meal together. In the ancient Near Eastern context, to invite guests to dine at your table was to enter into a, a covenant relationship with them. As one person has put it, it was like a, a formal friendship. To invite folks to, to dine at your table was to enter into uh, a formal friendship, we might say. Now, interestingly, in the New Testament, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 23, James refers to Abraham as a friend of God. And likely, James has in view this scene in the prayer that follows as he refers to Abraham as a friend of the Lord. 
I think of what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 25, verse 14. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him, and He makes known to them His covenant. Abraham is now a friend of the Lord, and he enjoys, he extends hospitality and enjoys a meal with the Lord. Now, there's several other passages in our Bibles and in Scripture also which highlight such a covenant meal. Let me give you just a couple examples. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, we've already covered this, uh, this scene uh, in some detail, the scene with Abraham and Melchizedek. We didn't note that Abraham and Melchizedek also enjoy a meal together. There's a bond between Abraham and Melchizedek. Or Genesis 26, 28 through 31, Isaac and Abimelech enter into a covenant with one another, and it says very clearly that they enjoy a meal together. And then one other example, one of the great and most important examples in our Old Testaments, we find in Exodus chapter 24, verse 11. Now, this is the scene in which the Lord enters into a covenant with His people Israel. Exodus 19 through 24 describe God's covenant dealings with His people Israel as He has delivered them on eagles' wings out of their bondage from, from Egypt. He brings them unto Himself and He enters into a covenant with them. And in Exodus 24, 11, we read of Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel. They, they ascend, they, they walk up the mountain as God has come down on the mountain, and what do they do? They dine and enjoy a meal together. Exodus chapter 24, verse 11. Now such meals, Abraham and Melchizedek, Isaac and Abimelech, the Lord with Moses and Aaron on the top of Mount Sinai, the meal that we're considering in our own passage. We might also think of the Passover meal under the Old Covenant, and also uh, the New Covenant meal, that is, the Lord's Supper. All of these such meals picture for us what? What are they, what are they symbolizing? What, what do they picture? Well, they picture for us the peace, the fellowship, the bond, the communion, the friendship, whatever term we want to use, they're all related. This theme that we are now friends of God by His grace. This bond, this relationship is pictured as, as the two parties, as, as the Lord and Abraham, as God and His church dine together. Now this communion, this communion that Abraham enjoys with the Lord and that we as believers enjoy with the Lord. This communion, dear friends, was the very goal of creation. We touched on this in an earlier lesson. This was the goal set before Adam and Eve, as Adam and Eve enjoyed communion with God, and they were going to enter into an even greater and advanced and perfected fellowship and communion with God. But of course, that was forfeited because of their sin. Such communion with God, pictured in this meal, pictured in this covenant meal, was the goal of creation, but also, dear friends, is the goal of redemption, is the goal of salvation. It is what we as Christians will enjoy forever in glory, when we will see our Savior face to face and will enjoy what the New Testament calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. That, that marriage supper we see faintly pictured here in Genesis 18 as Abraham enjoys a meal with the Lord. But also, before we leave this first theme, such fellowship, such friendship, such communion is to be the desire of our hearts here and now. The longing of your heart and of my heart is to, to grow, to grow into this communion that we have with the Lord because of the finished work of the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the psalmist say? Psalm 42, 1, As the deer pants for the water, so longs my heart for you. Dear friends, does your heart long for the Lord? It's a good question that we ought to be asking ourselves at least every Lord's Day, if not every day. Is my heart longing 
for greater and closer fellowship with God. May the Lord by His Spirit work such a a greater longing in each of our hearts. So the first thing we see in the first half of chapter 18, we see a feast. And it's a feast that speaks to the friendship and the fellowship and communion that Abraham enjoyed with the Lord. But then secondly, we see a prayer. Abraham talks to the Lord. Chapter 18, verses 16 through 33. The Lord reveals to Abraham what he is about to do. He takes Abraham into his confidence, we might say. He reveals to Abraham his purpose and plan. And in this case, God's purpose and plan is to bring judgment on the cities of the plain, as they're called, Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a couple things that we need to to, to keep in mind as we we think about the question, why does God reveal this to Abraham? The text doesn't explicitly tell us, but there's a couple things I think that we can surmise. The Lord wants to impress upon Abraham into us as readers the absolute distinction between the church and the world. The absolute distinction between the people of God and the people of the world, between the seed of the woman, those who belong to God, and the seed of the serpent, those who belong to the evil one. And this judgment that God is going to rain down on Sodom highlights in grandest scale the fate that awaits those who reject and turn from the Lord in contrast to the fate that awaits those who belong to the Lord by grace through faith. Then a second thought is that it is this truth, this this reality, this distinction that Abraham was called to to, to teach his family, that Abraham was called to to pass on to his family. It it speaks to the idea of what we call covenant nurture, Uh, that, that God's truth is to be passed down in our families from one generation to another. As children in Israel would ask their parents, Father, why are we celebrating the Passover? The father would then tell his his children a story. He would tell his children the story of the Exodus. So also Abraham was to tell his children the story of God's grace in his life, contrasted with the judgment that he brought on Sodom and Gomorrah. So it is in this context, this covenant context, this this friend-to-friend bond with the Lord having uh, received, with Abraham rather, having received God's word and revelation that Abraham then turns back to the Lord, prays to the Lord, talks to the Lord, and intercedes for the righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now just take a step back and think of what's going on in this passage. God is talking to Abraham. God is is giving revelation to Abraham. God is speaking to Abraham. And in light of that, what is Abraham doing? He is speaking back to the Lord. Notice this this two-way dialogue between God and Abraham, between God and his people. And dear friends, that is exactly what we as believers enjoy today. God speaks to us no longer as he spoke to Abraham, but he speaks to us and has spoken to us finally and fully and climactically in the person of his son and in our Bibles. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says that in these last days, God has spoken to us and what's implicit is that once and for all, finally, climactically, with nothing to be added, God has spoken to us in his son. And we respond, we speak back to the Lord in prayer. And so this this dialogue between the Lord and Abraham is to mark our lives as as we soak in God's word and as we talk to the Lord in prayer. Now, as we look at Abraham's prayer, we learn some wonderful lessons about prayer as we consider Abraham's intercession. Let me mention three very briefly. First, we note that Abraham prays to the Lord with boldness and with reverence. With boldness and with reverence. Abraham goes boldly to the Lord. He goes back again and again and again. If 50 righteous are found, if 40 righteous, if 30, and all the way he goes down again and again, Abraham goes back. He flees back 
to the Lord. But he also goes to the Lord with reverence. Look at verse 27. I who am but dust and ashes, shall I talk to the Lord? Abraham understands that he is but a finite sinful creature. And thus he's reverent, he's humble, but also he is bold. As he is a friend of God, as he flees to the Lord. Such is to mark our prayer life as well. We are to flee to the throne of grace with boldness, dear friends, but also with humility and reverence. A second lesson we can learn from Abraham's prayer is that the basis for Abraham's plea, the ground of his plea, is the very character of God. That God is just, but also merciful and gracious. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right, Abraham says to the Lord. And of course, God is the just judge who always does what is right. So the foundation for Abraham's plea, the foundation for Abraham's fleeing to the Lord is the very character of God as God has revealed himself to Abraham. But then thirdly, and I would suggest most importantly for us, Abraham's intercession points us forward to the great intercessor for us. That just as Abraham intercedes for the righteous in Sodom, so also the Lord Jesus Christ intercedes for you and for me. So also Jesus, our great high priest, intercedes for his people. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Dear friends, your Savior is interceding for you. And Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John that his prayer is always heard. His prayer for you, his intercession for you is always heard. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Just as Lot and his family had an advocate with God, Abraham, so we have an even greater advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we've considered two themes thus far. We've seen a feast, which speaks to Abraham's uh, fellowship and friendship with God. We've seen a prayer as Abraham, in the context of that friendship, in the context of that fellowship, Abraham flees to the Lord, interceding for his nephew Lot and his family. And then thirdly and finally, we see a judgment. Chapter 19, the judgment of God on Sodom, on wickedness and evil. In chapter 19, the Lord rains fire from heaven. He brings judgment on the wicked city of Sodom. And this section, chapter 19, teaches us some important principles regarding the judgment of God. And let me mention just a few principles briefly. First, chapter 19 reminds us of the reason for God's judgment. And put most broadly, sin. God's hatred of and revulsion to sin. In chapter 18, verse 21, we, we, read, we read of God's going down to see. The Lord goes down to see Sodom for himself. And we hear echoes there of the Tower of Babel, that God goes down to see the Tower of Babel. So likewise, God goes down to see the sin of Sodom. In the verdict, as he, as he investigates the sin of Sodom, the verdict is one of guilt. Guilty, guilty, guilty. In this chapter, Sodom is dripping in sin. It is, it is, it is covered in sin. Sin permeates every pore of the city of Sodom. Verses 4 and 5 speak to both the scope of the sin. That it's, not, it's not a sinful pocket here and there. It's not one sinful individual scattered about, but it is pervasive, the broad scope of the sin of Sodom. But also verses 4 and 5 speak to the, the heinousness and the, the vileness of the sin of Sodom. Homosexual rape. Absolutely no moral restraint at all 
ugly, vile, heinous sin that prompts God's judgment. So we notice the reason for God's judgment. But then a second detail, the reality of God's judgment. The judgment of God on Sodom is not, it's not a myth. It's not a fable. It's not just an example, but rather it is a real, historical, total, complete, and just judgment. That God, the just judge of all the earth, bringing judgment, reigning judgment on this wicked city. But also, we need to, we need to keep in view that this judgment, this real, historical, total, complete, just judgment is, is, is something else as well. That is, it is a, what we call a, a paradigmatic judgment. Now, what do I mean by that? That is that the judgment on Sodom is one of several judgment scenes, particularly in the Old Testament, that serve as models for the final judgment to come. It's one of several scenes in the Old Testament uh, of great judgment, but they point to and serve as a model of the even greater final climactic judgment to come. The greatest model judgment might be the, the flood in Genesis chapter 6 through 8, when the Lord uh, judges uh, all of mankind and floods the whole globe, except for Noah and his family. All of mankind faces the judgment of God. So likewise, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah point us forward to the greater final judgment to come. Now the Apostle Peter says this explicitly. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, the Apostle Peter speaks of the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah as an example of what will happen to the ungodly, of what will happen to those outside of Christ on the last day. So, we see a judgment. And we notice the reason for God's judgment, that is sin, wickedness, and evil. We notice the reality of God's judgment, that God's judgment is not just a myth, it's not just a fable, but it is a real historical judgment. God's judgment on Sodom pointing forward to the greater final judgment to come when Jesus returns on the last day. But then one more angle. We also learn about the rescue from judgment the rescue from judgment. Why is Lot rescued from judgment? Why is Lot delivered from the judgment that falls on Sodom? It's God's grace, dear friends. It is only because of God's grace. Verses 10 and verse 16, it is God's mercy. It is the Lord who seizes Lot and, seizes Lot and, and plucks him from the fire. It is God's sovereign grace alone that pulls Lot out of the place of judgment. In fact, very interestingly, Lot's rescue from Sodom is pictured as like an exodus. It's actually quite interesting. Lot's rescue from Sodom is pictured as an exodus from Sodom. In fact, there are several clues linking Genesis 19 in Lot's rescue from Sodom with the, 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 the exodus that Israel will enjoy and will experience in the book of Exodus. Just a couple of examples. In both Genesis 19 and in the actual Exodus event, we see individuals finding safety behind a door. Also, in both Genesis 19 and the Exodus and, and, and chapters immediately following, we see a longing to go back. We see Lot's wife looking back, parallel with the Exodus generation longing to go back. So the author is intentionally set, is putting together Lot's rescue from Sodom as, as a preview of Israel's Exodus from Egypt that is to come. Both scenes highlight the sovereign, powerful grace of of God, as God comes and seizes by grace, by sovereign grace, and delivers and seizes Lot and brings him out of Sodom. In like manner, the Lord comes and, and seizes and delivers and brings his people, his people Israel, on eagles' wings out of their bondage in Egypt. And dear friends, that is what God has done in your life 
and in my life. It is His sovereign grace alone that has saved us and that has plucked us from the fire. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, God saved us, not according to our own works, but according to His own mercy. Ephesians 2, 8, such a beautiful, well-known verse. By grace we are saved through faith, not of works, but of God's grace from beginning to end. Now one, two rather, final lessons as we close this lesson. This chapter, Genesis 19, speaks of sin and grace. The ugliness, the the vileness of sin, sin consumes, sin is never satisfied. Dear friends, we are to be on guard. We are to guard our hearts, for out of our hearts flow the issues of life. But we also see highlighted God's grace. And so may we give thanks for God's grace and mercy in our own lives. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, By the grace of God, I am what I am. So Lot would say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I was plucked from the fires that rained down on Sodom. And then finally, we need to take take a step back. And I want us to look at Genesis chapter 18 side by side with Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 18 to, to, to speak most broadly, speaks of life. Genesis chapter 18 is a chapter of life and communion and enjoying the presence of God. Remember Genesis 18, Abraham prepares the feast for the Lord and his messengers. And Abraham hears God's plan and Abraham responds in prayer. It, it, it's a statement, it's a chapter of life and fellowship and, and friendship and communion with God. What do we see in Genesis 19? We see judgment. We see death. Genesis 18, life. Genesis 19, death. Genesis 18, life in communion with God. Genesis 19, death for those who have rejected God and who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And dear friends, these are the two destinies for all people. For everyone who has has walked this earth, our end is either life or death. Life in the Lord Jesus Christ or judgment outside of him if we refuse his offer of grace. Remember what Jesus says in John chapter 10, the thief comes to only steal and kill and destroy. But I have come, Jesus says, the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I have come that you might have what? That you might have life and have it abundantly. Life and death. I close with the words of Romans 6.23. The Apostle Paul says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise God for his word.